in the UK with a lot of drug uh, consumption around me. And so I started kind of doing my own research and digging into that myself. The special operations community is not very big. I see new drug dealers, new the kind of drug distribution um, in, you know, in my hometown or around Europe. I'd spent time in Spain and other places there. Now, obviously, we have a, a much worse opioid epidemic in the United States. It's an incredible career you have, and it's pretty exciting that, that you know, some of your work is kind of, kind of braided into some of my life. You know, I was in, grew up in like Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley area. You know, it's heavy prevalence of gangs growing up. Where I first started hearing about the Mexican mafia tied into some of the cartel work and all the stuff that's transporting drugs all throughout the California area. Uh, and then eventually I went into the Border Patrol in 2009. I resigned in 2015. But during that time frame, it was a big Zetas kind of concern. That was the big fear at the time as how dangerous they are. My background before that was with 2nd and 75th Ranger Regiment, so I was a special operations ranger doing combat tours and over, overseas. So to think that potentially my career in the civilian world might have to be confronting someone with military tactics became very interesting to me. And so I started kind of doing my own research and digging into that myself. The special operations community is not very big, and so I was able to kind of get a hold of some of the individuals who were part of the original training of the Los Setas, which was pretty exciting to hear mm. kind of their original training and how it started to eventually how it ended up turning out. And so fascinating stuff. Um, what is it though that really sucked you into the car cartel culture? I know you said you went there originally to try and do kind of almost like combat camera. Um, but is it because it became the big talk of the town. It became the, the, the kind of the shiny penny in the room that's happening in Mexico. Yeah, sure thing. I'll, I'll answer that. I'll just give one second to say that uh, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but I've just re recently, the last few weeks, been very, very heavily involved covering the current conflict in Sinaloa. Um, everything about Mayo yes. kidnapping. We're going to get to the for yeah, sure. And just come, I've just come back from Sinaloa. I've just been on the ground there. Uh, working, covering that, and we can talk about what these wars, military, weird, hybrid wars look like. Uh, but I would say um, when I go back to when I got sucked into covering organized crime, um, I mean, first of all, uh, when I started off working for an English language newspaper in Mexico City, in actually an old newsroom, uh, it was a lot of fun. And partly the crime beat, I kind of fell into it naturally. I grew up in the UK with a lot of drug uh, consumption around me. Um, there was actually um, a, a bit of a heroin epidemic. We didn't use the word epidemic back in those days, but a heroin uh, epidemic. And I, I knew four youths who died of drug overdoses growing up and a lot of drugs around me. Um, now, obviously, we have a, a much worse opioid epidemic in the United States. But so I was kind of understood a bit the drug issue or kind of had a certain you know, an interest in like this is interesting. Um I see I've seen I see I see a new drug dealers, new the kind of drug distribution um in you know in my hometown or around Europe. I'd spent time in Spain and other places there. So I was interested in that connection. Uh but also it, it seemed intuitively this was a big issue, a big subject. However, it got much bigger while I was covering this. So it began really as a crime story. So when it was interesting that that like story of the war in Nuevo Laredo over the border from Laredo, Texas, was a kind of local Texan story. And at that time, I was working for the Houston Chronicle. We had the Dallas Morning News with a very good journalist called Alfredo Corchado, who was who was kind of at the peak of his career and you know was getting all kinds of scoops. And, and I was like you know trying to keep up with him. Uh, they had uh, the San Antonio Express. So it was local Texas newspapers interested in this turf war over the time it grew to become a much bigger national mexican story and international story so when it really kicked off in you started to see in 2008 you started to see the violence really shoot up you had felipe Calderon take the presidency in 2006 and start bringing the military into this in a very big way but then you had a big cartel reaction in 2008 and that was when you start to see Ciudad Juarez become the most violent city on the planet, the kind of crazy stuff, refugees and all this. So you started to see all the kind of, you know, and I started working with uh, foreign TV crews coming in 
uh, making 30 minute documentaries about this. I already had this experience on the ground with this. So it kind of got sucked in because it was such a big story. And then what happens, I think, to a lot of, we kind of said, you could say narco journalists, um, you know, there's a kind of a community of people who cover this stuff, mostly from here, from Mexico. But it's kind of a very hard thing to get out of. And it happens to a lot of us, you know, I see other uh, guys, you know, up, up at the trial of El Chapo and, 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 you know, see some veteran kind of guys who covered this for a long time. And he's like, oh, I'm going to get out of this. I, I'll give you a bunch of pending info I have. You can take it. And then I see him a few years later and he's still totally into this. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's very hard because this, I mean, this, you know, at the beginning, we thought maybe this, this could have been some big explosion for a couple of years. And now it's been um, close to 20 years or, you know, you could call it 20 years, depending where you, where you say where it started. Um, I believe it's kind of maybe like a 30 year war type thing. This a kind of historical period of violence uh, in Mexico yeah. and in many parts of Latin America. And and so yeah, it is kind of you keep getting sucked back into this into this violence. It's you say you just said it twenty years, but you, you think it's somewhere around a thirty year. You think there's a slowing down of this eventually? I mean, eventually. Look, you know, we we we, we, don't, we don't have crystal balls, and it's hard to predict the future. Uh, and and you say maybe you've got to have somebody who steps in and stops this. Uh, but this idea uh, first came from actually from from a Mexican intelligence agent. Who said this? Um, going back, and he said this, this will probably last about thirty years. Uh, and I think maybe he had an insight into some quite deep things in Mexican society here. Uh, and maybe I don't know. Maybe when we get to the future, what's going to stop this winding down? Is it going to be yet less uh, demographics change, and there's simply less young men on the street who want to become gunmen and want to go out yeah. and, and shoot stuff? I mean. Uh, it happened, one of the, this kind of blew up and there was various factors, but like there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of young people around who could be, and still are recruited by the cartels for pretty cheap money and used as cannon fodder. A lot of deportees from the US. Uh, actually, uh, the biggest number of deportees is, is I'm sure, you know, it, it, people, you know, the immigration issue starts to get, you know, very explosive and divisive about this, but it was under, President Obama, there was huge numbers of deportees. He didn't celebrate this, um, but they 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 cut a lot of low hanging fruit. A lot of anybody they could find with with criminal records, they start deporting under Obama. And so those years of two thousand nine ten, where there was a big escalation of violence here, and a, a lot of them were deportees. And some of these uh, crazy cartel leaders go back to the setas. There's a guy called El Kilo who was uh, who ordered. A massacre in San Fernando, Mexico. If you have ever heard of that famous massacre of seventy-two migrants by a cartel, and that was a deportee himself who was the guy who ordered that that massacre. But anyway, some you know you think, but I don't know, I've got no crystal ball, and maybe it takes, um, you know, who knows when this stuff's going to calm down. But right now, it's still going on full on all cylinders. Yeah, it's it's a wild time right now, and um, 